We're going to be talking today about soil ecology and the ways that you can use that to help your own gardens and help your soil. Because ultimately, if you're gardening, you're growing soil, um, not so much plants. Plants are almost the byproduct, um, which we're going to talk about more. Um, and just so you know a little bit about me, uh, I went to school at UC Santa Cruz for plant science, and that was really where I started getting very interested in, in soil, actually, even though I was a plant science major. Um, we learned a lot about some of the inner workings going on between plants and their soil environment, and that's actually one of the areas of science that's the least understood because the interactions going on in the root zone of plants and their corresponding soil environment are incredibly complex and they involve a lot of little tiny microorganisms that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so there's a lot of new stuff always coming out about this. This is certainly nowhere close to a comprehensive overview. A lot of this information is relatively new to myself and I'm going to recommend a couple books that you know, if you're interested in learning a little bit more. But ask questions and, oh, the other thing about me is I now um, co-own a company that designs edible gardens and, and overall sustainable landscapes. We do a lot of work with California natives as well. And so uh, if you have any questions about that stuff, save it till after. <laughs> um, okay, so. What is soil ecology? Soil ecology is looking at the interactions between the abiotic, or non-living, and biotic factors in the soil. So this right here is a, a diagram that I'm going to come back to later that just kind of shows, and you know, for you guys it's probably a little hard to see, but basically you have your plants which are called primary producers. They're taking energy from the sun and turning it into things like carbohydrates, which are are sugars, things that things like us like to eat, but a lot of other things like to eat that kind of stuff too. And a lot of organic material that's produced by plants isn't readily digested by people, so we have to rely on these other microorganisms, things like fungi, bacteria, to decompose those and turn them into the chemical elements that will help your plants grow and produce good things that you do want to eat. Okay, so just, I'm gonna, I'm kind of starting at the end and then we're gonna loop back to this point. <laughs> but basically, what you're gonna realize at, at the end of this lecture is, or, or what you're hopefully gonna have a better understanding of, is that different plants require different soil ecology to thrive. So, a grassland soil are, are very different than a forest soil. Question? Yeah, will this be online anyway? Um, I hadn't really planned on putting it online, um, but sure. maybe. I, I, I don't know if they're going to, they might be putting these online, I don't know. Are you willing to email them? Yeah, I could email them. Yeah, yeah, we, we can work something out. It's not confidential. <laughs> um, I just take, you know, 50% commission. <laughs> um, okay, so, so a grassland soil is going to be pretty different, both um, on an on a aesthetic level, you could look at it and see differences, but also on a, on a microbial level, if you looked at the little animals and critters that were moving around there, you would find different things, which makes sense. And so the real important thing that when we're talking about gardening is what your plants that you want to grow are going to prefer. And so basically, annual vegetables and grasses prefer nitrogen, which is the main building block of, of proteins and very impl important for plant growth. They prefer nitrogen in the form of nitrate, which is NO3. They prefer a bacterially dominated soil usually with, with a ratio of like one to one as far as bacteria to fungal biomass in the soil, so amount in, in weight of biomass. And they prefer a slightly alkaline environment, 
which is actually a little bit contrary to what a lot of garden philosophy has taught for many years. It was always that you wanted a slightly acidic environment. But we're learning more and seeing that that might not actually be true for, you know, of course, these are generalities. Not, this isn't true of all vegetables um, and annual crops, but it's certainly a trend that, that we're starting to see. Now, for your perennials, trees, and shrubs, you're going to tend to want a more fungally dominated soil that provides nitrogen in the form of ammonium. So, you know, you guys, I, I get mixed up between these <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> They're kind of hard to keep track of, but the basic thing is understanding that most of your vegetable crops are going to prefer a bacterially dominated soil, while most of your perennials and trees prefer fungally dominated soil. And everything that you see as far as your soil ecology goes is related to to that ratio of fungus to bacteria. So, like I was saying, by understanding your soil ecology, you can farm your soil and grow the type of soil that's going to help you grow the type of plants that you're looking for. <laughs> These are some pretty mean looking bacteria. And so basically the, the main the main microbes that I'm gonna be talking about, most in detail are fungus and bacteria. But it's also good to note that there are these little guys called protozoa. There are tons of different kinds of nematodes, arthropods and earthworms, all helping to create your soil ecosystem. And we're gonna to touch briefly on all of those ones. Okay, so bacteria for one thing, provide food for many other microbes, things like nematodes and protozoa. And they also, there are types that convert nitrogen from the air, which, how many of you know roughly what, mo or what most of air actually is? Yeah, yeah I, kind of, I kind of gave it away, but a lot of people <laughs> don't realize that air is not mostly oxygen. It's mostly nitrogen gas. And so, without the presence of these bacteria pulling nitrogen in the form of N2 out of the air, our life would look very, very different because it would be, you know, we don't have a way of taking nitrogen out of the air and turning it into a usable form. Um, so, that's a really important role that they play. The other thing that bacteria do is convert. <laughs> yeah, okay, I get mixed up. They convert ammonium into nitrate. So if you have a lot of bacteria in your soil, they're going to be converting ammonium, which is the type of nitrogen favored by most trees and perennial crops. They're going to be converting that into nitrate, which is preferred by your vegetable crops. So... <laughs> I'm going to try not to bundle these words up. And most bacteria prefer a slightly alkaline environment. They produce these bacterial slimes that help with soil retention, they help re or they retain nutrients, and they create spaces for water to be held and absorbed, and they create a slightly alkaline soil. So fungi are one of my favorite things. How's it going? Um, there, I, I could spend a day just talking about fungi. So, <laughs> so once you start learning about them, they are incredibly fascinating organisms. Um, they're able to transport nutrients through fairly large distances. I, I heard from one article that I read that they've been demonstrated to transport water from like riverbeds in, chap in coastal chaparral 300 feet up a slope through these network of, of fungi. And so they are very, very amazing creatures. And 
it's debated whether or not the biggest organism, single organism in the world, is actually actually a fungus. Um, there are some rivaling viewpoints on that, but it covers a huge distance, and it's all the same organism. They're all able to share nutrients. So the really important thing that fungi are able to do is they're able to decompose lignin and and <coughs> very woody materials. So when a tree falls and you see dead wood rotting in the, in the forest, have you guys ever seen mushrooms growing out of that? That's because they're a lot more effective at decomposing that woody stuff much more so than bacteria are. So bacteria prefer a finer, greener material, whereas the fungi are able to decompose these really tough woody materials and recycle them back into your soil environment. Fungi produce a lot of acids, so they tend to acidify their environment, and so usually they're found in a more acidic environment. Um, so back to, to uh, I just wanted to kind of touch back on this. so. Here you have fun fungi and mushroom or fungi and bacteria. They're decomposing, bringing nutrients back into your soil <clears throat> through nitrification. These bacteria are able to convert some of the nitrogen that's being released by fungi in the form of ammonia, uh, <laughs> in the form of ammonium, and turn it into other forms like nitrate that are usable by other plants. That was kind of random to have it in there. I don't know why I had that there. <laughs> but so the other whole area of fungi that are incredibly important is this relationship that we see, this symbiosis between plants and fungi. And this is called mycorrhiza. There are, a couple, there are a few different forms, don't really want to get into the different forms of mycorrhiza because that's, again, a whole other topic, but basically these fungi form associations with plant roots. More than 80% of all plant species form these associations with fungi, and these fungi allow plants to access water, phosphorus, other mineral nutrients much more effectively than the, can, than the plant can on their own. Some plants need mycorrhiza, other plants can grow without them. Likewise, there are mycorrhiza that must associate with plants. There are some that can be free dwelling in the soil. Um, so there's an incredible diversity, but without these associations, plants are much more prone to water stress they're much more prone to disease um, and other pathogen invasion because they don't have these fungal symbionts. And so what this is a picture of, if you've ever seen a plant root with really, really fine white looking hairs, actually I guess, I'm gonna hold off on that. Um, those are mycorrhiza and they form what are called root hairs they're these very, very thin, thin, thin hairs that the fungi produce these acids from, and it helps mineralize nutrients, bring them up into the plant, and grow the plant. So, protozoa are another microbe that lives in your soil. You can't see them, but they're there, especially if you have a healthy soil. And these guys are feeding on bacteria, as well as, I, I think they eat fungi too, but mostly they're eating bacteria, and their poo provides more nutrients for plants. So hopefully this stuff isn't too overwhelming <laughs> information-wise, but what I'm trying to get across is that in your root zone of your plant, there's this incredible ecology, all these organisms at work all the time. The problem 
is that when you use synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, you disrupt a lot of the microbiology going on in your soil. And when you do that, it's a cascading effect because you stop, you, you essentially prevent the natural nutrient cycling that's happening naturally, and so then you in turn have to supplement it. So these protozoa are cruising around, finding bacteria, eating bacteria, pooing them out, and releasing all these great plant nutrients right in the root zone of your plants so that they can access them. And so, unfortunately, I don't know if you guys can read this, but this is kind of a breakdown. No, nope, can't read it at all. So I'm going to read it for you in case <laughs> you want to write it down. So, plants produce things that are called root exudates. Sounds like a scary word, but it's really just sugars. It's carbohydrates that the plant's producing, and it's releasing those from its roots to attract these fungi, bacteria, into their root zone. So you have the plant releasing these sugars to attract these microbes. Bacteria and fungi move into the root zone to eat those. And then you have things like protozoa as well as nematodes moving in to feed on those bacteria and fungi. Cycling those nutrients all right in the root zone area where when they're mineralized and released they're immediately accessible to the plants. So, first time I heard about nematodes was, well, what do you guys know about nematodes? There's good ones and there's bad ones. Yeah. <laughs> but they can destroy tomatoes. Plant marigolds. Plant marigolds. So, when I first heard about them, all I knew was that they could destroy tomatoes. But it turns out that the vast majority of nematodes are good. There are hundreds of different kinds of nematodes that cruise around in a healthy soil, and they eat stuff, and they cause no harm to plants. And one of the ways that you can counteract the harmful ones is by maintaining healthy populations of non-harmful ones. But if you, you know, use some kind of ne nematicidal pesticide and kill off all your nematodes, then you've basically created an empty slate for harmful ones to come and invade your plants. Um, so kind of like the protozoa, these are great recyclers. They eat bacteria, they eat fungi, they eat other nematodes, and they poo them out, and it's... It's great. It's like a little mini, you know, pasture in the, in the soil. Arthropods are another really important part of your soil system. Um, ants, bugs, mites, spiders, those are all under the kind of broad class of arthropod. Um, and basically, they're responsible for shredding material. If you ever find, like, pill bugs, um, Earwigs. Earwigs, all your insects, they shred stuff and they help break it down. Things like wood chips, they might eat organic material, they break it down into smaller pieces that are then accessible or more accessible to bacteria and fungi for further decomposition. So all those ants crawling around you're saying are a good thing? They are not a bad thing, necessarily. They're, and, and that's another kind of general note to, that I hope people get out of this talk, is that most things aren't bad all the time. And having a population of ants is really important because if you, you know, if your cat kills a squirrel and leaves it, its body hanging out, like, in your garden, who's going to come and eat that up? It's probably ants. Hmm. And they're going to help decompose that, break it down, make it so that it's not a smelly piece of waste. They like that stuff. and So they're a very important part of your ecosystem. But if they're farming aphids on your 
fruit trees and artichokes, which they love to hide in artichokes, or the aphids do, um, then maybe they're not such a good thing. But, but the way you go about controlling a pest like that becomes very different when you decide, okay, maybe I don't want ants climbing up my fruit tree, but I don't want to destroy the whole colony. So you leave them eroding? <laughs> maybe, maybe you could do a decoy like that, but <laughs> I've never really, never really tried that. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. <laughs> They're actually growing the aphids. They, 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 um, they milk them just like we milk cows. They carry them on the leaves and they plant them. Yeah. And then they milk them. So that's why my orange tree is full of aphids, because of the ants. Yeah, but your orange tree is full of aphids because of the ants, so if you control the ants, you control the aphids. So how do you do that? I'll get to that after. <laughs> I'm finished with this. So, earthworms, everybody knows earthworms. Everybody, or most people, think that they're a good thing to see in your garden. It's a pretty general consensus, and they are. Um, they're a really good thing. Their castings, or their poo, tends to be about 50% higher in organic matter than soil that has not been digested by them. It's much higher in phosphorus, nitrogen, a whole host of other plant nutrients. And they tend to be found more in bacterially dominated soils because they eat bacteria. And a lot of their poo has bacteria on it that are in there, get in through their digestive tract. Hmm. Good, good bacteria? And, yeah. Um, and so, worm castings tend to be higher in bacteria than a compost that, than, than just your average compost, probably. Um, but they tend to be higher in bacteria than a more woody compost. I heard that the red wigglers you're supposed to leave in your compost, otherwise they'll actually eat your plants if you put them in your garden. Is that true? I've heard that, and I've not experienced that, and I don't know why that idea gets... I've never had a problem. So, um, There are places where earthworms have become a problem, but it's usually in forest systems where... The wor I mean, most of our worms were introduced by, by Europeans. I think, I'm not sure about red worms. Red wigglers are a special variety. They, they live in the leaf layer, they don't bury, and they, uh, they only eat stuff that's going to decompose, so they're not eating stuff that's alive. Oh, okay. Because they wind up from my compost in my garden and my other yeah, plants. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, if your plants are disappearing, you should definitely figure out what's eating them. And if it's the worms, then stop throwing them in there. But but I don't think it will, that you'll find hmm. that. Did you have a question? Um, okay, so why does all this matter? Um, depending on what you're growing, you want to promote a soil system that's either going to be favoring fungus or favoring bacteria. Um, and those different ecologies are going to hopefully make your plants grow real well. So... For a bacterially dominated soil, you want to be looking at using green mulches. Things like grass clippings, worm castings are really good. Um, I use alfalfa a lot, which is a very nitrogen rich. Um, you can get alfalfa bales of hay, and they make a great mulch. Um, but grass clippings, if you can get them, are really good too. And this is a picture that, again, you can't really see. But this is one of one of our gardens where we've got broccoli mulched with a about a three inch layer of alfalfa straw, and then I recently planted a tomato straight into that. Just move the mulch away, no turning of the bed, and it's growing really well. And which is another thing. So this is, a, this is a picture of a tree where 
we had a cover crop that was actually a mix of legumes and grasses, but we just chopped it up and let it dry out. And so now it's more of a brown mulch that's very dry, and that's going to favor fungal decay. So, and there's also a, a bunch of wood chips around this as well. Question? If you were to, sometimes you know, they say just chop up the, your fava beans or whatever before they flower and they come back into the soil, that would be a green one? Yes, definitely. Okay. So like the stalks tend to be more of a brown one. Yeah, so the stalk, if you have, if you let your favas mature and then chop them, then they're probably going to be more woody it's going to require. It's going to be harder for bacteria to break them down. So you're probably probably going to be getting more fungal decay on those. And if you throw them all together, you're not doing it very effectively. Well, you know, these are all just things to. You know, there's still an incredible amount that's not understood about these processes. So I try all kinds of things, <laughs> and I recommend that you guys do too, and figure out what works for you. Um, so, but yeah, generally speaking, favas are going to be a green mulch. Any type of bean plant is going to be a green mulch, but the older that plant gets, the more stiff and woody and, and tough it gets, the more that's going to be favoring fungal decay because they're the organisms that are able to break down those more complex molecules. Um, so, the other thing that... I wasn't sure. I'm not sure how long. I wasn't sure how long this was all going to take. But so when you start gardening like this, you start turning your soil a lot less. And part of the reason that I've been wanting to turn soil less is because for our company, if we have to go in and turn soil, that's time, and it's the pain in the ass. It's much easier if we don't have to. And what we've been finding is that we don't have to. By using appropriate mulches and composts and soil amendments, <clears throat> all those little critters, they move that stuff through the soil and they're working all the time. And so it's, it's been really, really interesting to to be seeing how, you know, we still do turn some of our beds, but more and more I'm advocating not doing that. There are other problems that can arise, like sometimes we end up with out of control populations of pill bugs. And that's like one of our biggest challenges. Nobody, <laughs> nobody else has problems with pill bugs because they don't mulch, but pill bugs like to live under mulch. And so if you have any, <laughs> <laughs> advice to shed on it. But Put your what, strawberries away from the mulch. <laughs> exactly. You know, that that's a great point. Yeah. From now, like, I just recently made a decision that I was not going to plant strawberries except in, like, rock gardens <laughs> because they just get munched on. So, what else do the pill bugs do? That's bad. They'll just chow. On whatever. whatever you got. But, I mean, they really like strawberries. But for most, for most other vegetable crops, they're really only a problem when the plant's really young. So if you can get it past that first stage, then they're usually fine. And so one thing that we'll do is we'll have plastic cups, and we'll cut the bottom off. And you put that around your baby plant, and they can't climb up the plastic. Toilet paper dispensers, paper towel dispensers. Too. Um, I, I don't know if that would have the same effect because it's cardboard and that they would climb on. So you kind of need the plastic. Uh, yeah, so that they can't get any traction. There's water bottles. We at school garden, we did that. We the kids all cut water bottles and put them around the little baby plants mm -hmm. so that they could get tall enough and that. Yeah. That seemed to work pretty well. Yeah. So, but. The, using the plastic is something that they can't grip onto, um, but this is a hot area of research for <laughs> for our company because we're always trying different stuff to figure out ways. I, I mean, sometimes we'll just move away the mulch to get things germinated and then bring it back on once they're bigger, 
and we've had success with that. So there's different things that you can do, but um, okay. So now I'm gonna. These are some soils that I just dug up this morning. Kind of nice that it rains, so you'll really be able to see all the life that's in one versus the other. Um, these are both from my house. This one is from a pathway where there's nothing there, it just gets walked on. And so this was kind of, I think you'll be able to tell the difference, but this is just pretty lifeless soil that's just been compacted. You know, I haven't been spraying herbicides on it or anything, but there's not a whole lot going on. This is essentially the same soil that's been mulched with organic mulches, wood chips, and compost for the past two years. And so you can smell the difference, you can see the difference, and so you guys can pass these around and kind of check them out. And just the, the one that I dug up from, from the area that had been mulched, just in that one shovelful, I mean, if you poke around in there, there's like a dozen worms just cruising around. And like I said, those are working to create pore space, increase water filtration, and they're doing it all the time. Uh, I was just had a question because um, as I get older my eyes get worse. And I can see worms and I can see you know I can see you know I can smell if the soil smells good and I can um, you know I know a fungus when I see it. But outside of that like I just have to believe in the nematodes, right? I mean, <laughs> on the protozoa and all that. I mean, is there anything you use to to look at that, to well, examine that level of things? Uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, but basically, if you have some of these larger critters, that's a sign that that's a good sign that, that things are there. If you find, you know, mushrooms coming up in your soil, that means that you have fungus. And if you move it away and see the, uh, are you, I don't know if you all are familiar with mycelium, but if you've ever seen the kind of white webbing that you sometimes see in good soil, that's fungus. And, and mushrooms are just a tiny part of fun, fungi, fun, fungi. And, Mushrooms, which, which this was something else that I was pretty interested. Yeah, they're they're like the flower of the mushroom. So, the mushroom might be huge, or I mean, I, I mean the the mycelium, the fungi spreading throughout the soil can be very extensive, and then you get a mushroom. But that's really just a flower. That's just indicating that there's this other, much more complex, larger organism dwelling in there. Nasty like orange, and it turns white or white orange. Black. Yeah, it's black. Yeah, that's scientific name for that is dog vomit slime mold. <laughs> and uh, the good news is that it's not harmful to plants. I've actually had lavender plants get like half covered by it, and they were fine. But. But yeah, the first time I saw it, I was like, uh oh. <laughs> Wait, are you talking about that webbing on top? Uh, or, no. I'm talking about the mold, like the thing that you're it talking about. It looks like crust. Yeah, yeah, it looks like, like dog vomit. Or, yeah. yeah. How many of you guys have seen the dog vomit on your like wood chips? Don't worry. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's totally fine, it's totally normal. They, they're another organism that I don't think we know a whole lot about. They don't know what makes it do that or why it decides to, but it's a type of slime mold and it's a decomposer. Yeah, um, so as far as pH, um, I don't really worry about pH. What I do is I manage my soil for whatever I want to be growing. And sometimes that means, you know, your first crops don't do the best. Um, but over time, your pH will adjust 
based on the type of ecology that you cultivate in your soil. So if you are promoting bacteria, you're going to end up with a slightly basic soil system. If you're promoting fungi, you're going to tend to end up with a lower, more acidic pH. Um, as for soil amendments, we almost exclusively use compost and wood chips. Those are like our primary soil amendments. Occasionally I will use uh, organic fertilizer and it's hard to say, you know, how environmentally friendly some of these organic fertilizers are. I was using Dr. Earth, but they're owned by Kellogg and so either way, we use them, but we use them very sparingly. And they're useful because a lot of them have mycorrhiza inoculants in them, which can be help boost your plants a little bit by adding those beneficial organisms to your soil. And, you know, they've usually got bone meal, which is often coming from agricultural waste, fish meal, same thing. Um, so I think there's a place for them, but don't use what they recommend, <laughs> you know, use much less than that. You really don't need to be putting, you know, two cups around your fruit trees every spring or <laughs> whatever they call or, and, and then like a second, uh, and then an application every month after that. You know, you really, you don't need to do that if you're cultivating your soil and if you're adding organic amendments wood chips and compost for vegetable gardens. City Farmers is a great place to get compost. They're here in City Heights. Um, they have a very good compost. And um, there is a guy who does worm farming. I always, it's kind of hard to find online, but if you type in red wiggler or like red worm fertilizer products, I think his name's Daniel. He's pretty cool. Red, red <laughs> He's this little compost. Colombian guy who's like living out in Escondido and just farming all these worms. He's, he's, he's pretty cool. So he's got a <laughs> he's got a good good product, but his compost is really basic. So I got his compost and ended up using it on some fruit trees and they didn't look super happy. And you know, now we've added wood chips around those fruit trees and, and things are getting back in balance. But his compost is very basic. It's bacterially dominated, so it'd be great for vegetable gardens, but you might not want to use it around your fruit trees. The compost from the dump, which I once tried to use on a vegetable garden and failed miserably, is, is a great mulch for your fruit trees. So, there, there, some of these, basically, I started learning about this stuff after I made those mistakes, and it just made a lot of sense. And so, I'm gonna, these are just some other pictures which you kind of can't see, so. Um, the two books that I wanted to recommend are, one is called Teeming with Microbes, um, it's a, I just read it, and it's awesome. It's a really good book, We've got a lot of information, expands a lot more about the things that I was talking about. You know, none of these things are Bibles, so you shouldn't do just what they say, like, they don't advocate using animal products in your compost, or, or manures in your compost. But I think, you know, I've got chickens, and that is a great source of nutrition for plants. And I'm not going to not use my own chicken manure. <laughs> but so, but it, it, it's a great book as far as, like, microbiology. I think it's one of the more readable. Because it's written by guys who are actually more, like, not scientists. They were gardeners who ended up getting caught up in microbiology. Um, you had a question. What impact do GMOs have on this? On the 
I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> That's the whole problem with GMOs is that nobody knows. So just if you guys didn't hear, his question was, what impact do GMOs 